Welcome to the Bar Bend Podcast, where we talk to top athletes, coaches, influencers, and thinkers from around the world of strength sports. Presented by barbend.com. Today on the Bar Band Podcast, I'm really excited to welcome Sean Pastuch to the show. He is someone with a long history in the fitness industry, so I'm excited to talk to Sean about the fitness industry's growth, branding, personal branding, and what it really takes to build a company in this space. Sean, thanks so much for joining today. Today, if you wouldn't mind giving the listeners just a little background on kind of where you're coming from and how you got involved in fitness. David, I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Obviously, you know, I've talked to you now for for years since back when you were Reebok Fifth Ave, when you were working with the Rhinos, all the kind of stuff that you were doing in the past. I've always had immense respect for you and the way that you run your business and your show. Uh, So I appreciate you having me on. A little bit of background about how I got myself into fitness is easy. I was 103 pounds freshman year of high school. 103. I was, and I know it's 103 because I wrestled in the 103 pound weight class. And the guy ahead of me in the weight class was eighth place in the nationals. And I was not, but there was no weight class to cut down to. So I would just go to practice every day and get my ass kicked. And I'm like, this sucks. I got to get stronger. I got to get bigger. (laughs) So, um, I just, I started getting into weightlifting and into exercise because I knew if I wanted to get out of wrestling where I, you know, it was a walk on, but I was going to get beat up every day and not really make much improvement. Uh, I wanted to do something and play basketball was that thing. And I wasn't strong enough, fast enough, athletic enough to make that team. So I started getting my ass in gear and that's how fitness started for me back in sophomore year of high school. When did you, Uh, when did you realize that you could make a career of that because the the fitness world, the strength world, it's really expanded in in a huge way over the last decade or so. But, you know, back when, back when we were in, you were in high school, back when I was in high school, um, the trajectory of making that a legitimate career and a profession wasn't, wasn't so clear to a lot of people. I don't think. No, I, I I remember watching one of those trashy TV shows like temptation Island or something. (laughs) The first time through, and one of the guys on it was a personal trainer. And they talked about how he made $50 an hour. And I started doing the quick math. And I'm like, whoa, he can work 20 hours a week and make $1,000. And I was in high school. So I'm like, that's that's freaking awesome. I want to do that. Um, But I didn't. I went to college. And senior year of college, when I realized that I knew what I was doing in a weight room, at least at the at the relatively simple level, I figured there's got to be room for me to teach people how to do this because I'm looking around and they have no idea Mm. what's going on. Like I came back between my sophomore and junior year of college, having really dedicated the summer to getting in great shape. And everybody thought I came, I had taken steroids and I'm still 160 pounds. So it's not like I was huge when I came back, Uh, but it was just that I understood principles of exercise. So senior year, I started informally doing some personal training in the weight room at University of Maryland. And then I got my license to actually be a personal trainer the summer that I I graduated. And and, uh, the the evolution of how I was going to do that evolved quickly because I'll give you you a little bit more of the background. I I was working at a terrible gym on purpose. I looked for the worst gym I could possibly find knowing that I didn't want anyone to ever know I existed mm. from the things I did at that gym. Hide, I wanted to hi, learn. Hiding in the shadows. Yeah, I wanted to learn everything. I wanted to make all of the mistakes that I could possibly make without being, you know, on the stage that I was going to do them on. And by the way, there's never that stage. You're always chasing a false peak. But I was young. I didn't know any different. Mm. So I learned how to put together a selectorized machine, how to clean the mirrors in a gym with newspaper. I learned everything about the personal training business in a world gym. Then I went to Equinox, which is like the top of the mark, personal training gym business, 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 business. Let me use that as the emphasis for what they are. And I learned so much. And the biggest thing that I learned was 
the best way to help people is to be looking for the people who other others have discarded. You know, everybody wants to train the hot chick and the jack dude. I was upstairs in the pool looking for the overweight man, the overweight woman who didn't want to come downstairs and quote, embarrass themselves on the gym floor. So while it would take the average trainer in the gym six months to become full time, if they ever got there, it took me five weeks. And I had clients who really valued what I was doing with them. And I had a major pivot at that point because I was taking my clients up to the physical therapy suite that was at the gym and asking, hey, what do I do with these people? Like, she, she has frozen shoulder. He has a hip problem. This guy's got a back problem. What do I do? And they never told me what to do. They just told me what not to do. Oh, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. I was like, that sucks. I can teach them something. I just need to learn something first. So I went back to school to be a chiropractor. And then I graduated the smartest person in the world, if you would have asked me. And then over the course of the last nine years, I've learned that that wasn't true either. <laughs> like I just continue to try to surround myself with people like you and people on my staff who are smarter than me in something about what it is that they do so I can learn from them. And that's that's a fantastic segue because I first became aware of Active Life and what you're doing at Active Life RX um, through through the CrossFit space, through your work with a lot of very, you know, the the jacked dude, the jacked chick, these people performing at this elite level. And so my my first conception, this was years ago, of what you were doing in your brand was working with, you know, the 1% of the 1% of top performers. Um, mm-hmm. Since then, I've I've learned that your brand is is really built for it's really built for the rest of us and what your those athletes you're working with at the top have a lot of the same problems a lot of the same imbalances that the average gym goer might have like you or me sometimes exacerbated because of their high level of volume of training and their very high level of fitness so tell us a little bit about the early stages of active life and kind of how you began began to identify communities and groups of athletes that you wanted to work with, that you wanted to target? So I was, to to make that long story concise, I was treating patients out of my father's chiropractic clinic and and I was enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I was learning from my father, I was learning from my uncle and we come from a family of chiropractors. It was great. The problem is I was way less efficient than they were at helping a patient. So I I was clogging the machine, if you will, because it took me too long to treat patients. And to be frank, they weren't seeing the kind of patients who I was enjoying my conversation with. Mm. You know, uh, I wanted more active populations. So I started doing CrossFit at CrossFit Garden City on advice of my friend Chris Stepien, who had gone there previously. I loved it. I was like, this is cool. Like, this is hard. I thought I was in good shape. Apparently, I'm not. And um, I remember wearing basketball sneakers to do push presses one day. And this guy was like, you don't want to wear those shoes because the bubble in the heel will throw you off balance when you sink your weight down. And I was like, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but I love these shoes. You know? <laughs> and I think that was, I wore them like one more time and that was the end of that. Uh, but so I started treating patients out of CrossFit Garden City and quickly recognized that the town I lived in didn't have a CrossFit gym mm-hmm. and didn't have a, a clinic that I thought was doing the right kind of care. So I reached out to a friend of mine and said, you should open the CrossFit gym. I'll help. I'll run the clinic. They'll be attached. I can serve the population that goes there. It'll be great. And that's what we decided to do. Um, And that was the way that we did that was the first of, I don't know, 10,000 massive mistakes I made along the way. But one of the mistakes, one of the things I did that was not a mistake was I recognized that even when I was working at Equinox, I didn't always have so much respect for the way that the busiest trainer in the gym would train his clients, but I always respected the way that he built his business. And the way he built his business was he would have the hot chick, the jack dude, working out with him in the middle of the floor, doing what looked like a choreographed fight scene from a movie. (laughs) You know, and and I'm like, everybody's just watching this guy. He's not getting anybody fit, but I, I, he's busy. So what I, what I took from that was, okay, maybe that doesn't have to be all of my clients, but if I can get attention using that kind of a clientele, 
maybe I can get more. Mm. So I looked around and said, who is the best, most influential CrossFit athlete in the area where I am? I looked within two hours and it was Daniel Tominski at CrossFit Lindy. So I reached out to Dan and I said, Hey, I know you don't know me. I'd love to come by, do an evaluation on you and see if there's anything that I can do to give you an edge over the people you compete against in CrossFit. What, what year was this roughly? 2012. All right. So this was during Dan's kind of streak of just, Back to back to back to back CrossFit Games finishes. He was like, you could bet on him year after year at that point. He was correct, pretty much at the top of the game. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so I would, so he, you know, there was some back and forth and he said yes eventually. And I would drive out to Dan to help him with all of the little ailments that he was dealing with. And we, we grew a friendship. You know, I went to his house for a 4th of July party. Um, and he, actually was not a great resource of referrals, but he referred me to his girlfriend, who is now his wife, I believe, Ricky Long. Um, and she was very active on her social media account and was pumping me out all over the place, led to things like Chrissy May Cagney, who she was friendly with, who came to an event that I ran, Flex in the City, and then came to my clinic, became a patient. And when she had 165,000 Instagram followers, she started telling everybody about it. And so it was, it was just continuing to ask people if there's anybody who they knew, who they thought I should be helping to refer them to me. And it just led to the right people. I never said like, hey, do you know anybody with a lot of Instagram followers who wants free treatment in exchange for a post? It was just, do you have any friends who really need the kind of help that I provided you? Yes. So... Working with these athletes at the beginning um, seemed very organic. They were pushing you out because they had a fantastic experience. You were helping them. Um, a little further on as Active Life, the brand started to kind of coalesce. Um, you started working, I noticed, with athletes who you would you would bring in, you would shoot promotional content around them. It was a little more formalized. And, and how did you kind of get to that next step of not only helping them, obviously, but but you know, being a little more direct on leveraging their reach and utilizing that. Mm -hmm. Great question. So it, it started off as actually I'm in my parents' house right now. It started off here in my parents' house. It's funny you ask. One of Chrissy May Cagney's boyfriend at the time was Drew Canavero, who was on the San Francisco fire. And Drew was like, you should work with um, these guys from Brute Strength. They're brand new. They need somebody like you. So we started connecting with them and they started hooking us up with their athletes. So their athletes were a variety of different elites, right? But um, we didn't have a way to really connect with them because they were wherever they were. We were where we were. Drew had a friend named Will Dermody and he's like, Will wants to see you. I told him he needs to see you in person. He's willing to come out. I'm like, he lives in Nevada. Like, it's not worth it. Why would he ever come out for an appointment? And he was like, dude, he thinks it's worth it. Make it worth it. Like, All right. So I talked to Drew and I talked to, to, um, to, why am I forgetting his name right now? Jesus. So I talked to him on the phone <laughs> and I'm like, look, here, here's how it would work. I guess we would need three days and we would assess this and then we would assess this and then we would assess this over the course of those three days, it would be about two hours a day. And he's like, okay. And he's like, what would that cost? And I'm like, um, how about a thousand dollars? He's like, yeah, cool. When are you free? I was like, shit, I have no idea. So, uh, Will Dermody, I don't know why I forgot Will's name. So Will ends up coming out from Nevada. He's the first person ever to do it. And I'm like, wow, people came out for this stuff. That's cool. And then Jared Stevens was in um, at CrossFit Solace for Noble. And I was working with him through Brew. And I'm like, you're in New York. I'm coming to meet you. So I drove into the city to meet with Jared just to, to check him out in person because we were working together online. And I knew I needed to build some trust. And I started evaluating him in the downstairs of CrossFit Solace. And we only had like 20 minutes. And I'm like, damn. 
I wish I had all three days with you. You should come back. So the next day he came out with his wife to my gym and we did more evaluation. And then he came back out again a few months later and we did the full eval. I'm like, this is a real thing. So we built a, what we call the intensive assessment, the intensive visit. And it was where athletes from all over the world, not just the ones that we worked with who were elite and, you know, promoting us would come out and they would get the assessment. They would pay the thousand dollars for three days of assessment. And then we would write them programs when they left. And that became like the, Hey, if, if you need help, because now at this point, to be honest with you, we were reaching out to some elite athletes, but mostly they were reaching out to us. And it was, yeah, look, we will work with you. If you fly out of here on your own dime and we can create content around evaluating and managing care with you. Mm -hmm. So you're setting those value expectations up, up front. You're saying, this is what, this is what you're getting out of this. We know the value of this. We've established that people are flying in and paying for that. We're Mm -hmm. getting, we have some promotional expectations or asks that we would ask for in return there. Yeah. I was like, look, I I would happily pay you a thousand dollars to, to promote me. But I wouldn't pay you $1,000 to promote me if you don't actually know what I do and mm-hmm. don't actually think that I'm valuable. Right. So if you would fly out here on your own dime, we'll do the evaluation for three days for free in exchange for being able to document it. And then as you promote the service that you're receiving, we'll continue to offer it for you at no cost. Once you stop promoting it, we have to stop providing it. And we even went the other way. Uh, where we had athletes who were promoting us because they felt like it was their duty to do it, who were not doing all of the things that we asked them to do, who are household names in the CrossFit world, who we fired as clients. Because the last thing that we wanted to do was um, have somebody not get the results that they should and be promoting us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that could have negative repercussions for your brand. And for them, all around. Mm -hmm. You know, it it was... it was, the, it was a hard thing to do because the first time we did it, we did it with the top 10 athlete in the world. You know, repeat top 10 athlete with the CrossFit Games. And I was like, look, if, if you feel like this is what you need to do in your training, even though I'm telling you I think it's a bad idea, I understand why you want to pursue that. I have to let you go as a client. I can't keep you on knowing what the risk that you're taking. Um, now, truth be told, he ended up being right. Nothing went wrong, and his career has been just fine. He also sent a thank you card. You know, like there's no hard feelings. When I see him, we're still friendly. Um, It's just that we weren't willing to take that risk with our brand. Mm -hmm. Those Those are difficult conversations, and it's very difficult to end partnerships, relationships that have worked out well, but then there you come, there arise situations where maybe no one's necessarily wrong. There's just a difference in opinion, direction. Um, Maybe people are weighing impacts differently and and you do have to have those conversations, but you always want to leave it open down the road in case interests and ideas align again. Well, and what what I can say to your listeners and to you is um, I've actually sought coaching for how to end the, like specifically sought coaching for how to end relationships so that the door can stay open. I've, I've paid somebody money to teach me how to tell somebody I no longer want to work with them so that they might come back one day when their mindset and my mindset better line up. And it's been some of the most valuable money I've ever spent because now instead of having all these people out there who are like, Sean's a fucking asshole. Like he just fired me as a client. Just said one day we're done. They're all like, you know, he, he, he actually did a really nice thing. And he told me that if, I want to train like this, then what he would ask me to do would be extremely stressful for me. And so right now it's probably best that I train like this and come back if it ever makes sense to train like that. So you've turned firing a client or ending that relationship into an opportunity for even better word of mouth referral. Because people hear that and they think, wow, this guy, Sean, he's, he's really got his athletes and his client's best interests at heart. The, the client who I'm... Yeah, the client I'm talking about specifically right now, who is a top 10 CrossFit Games athlete, who if you are a CrossFitter, you know who it is. Um, by name, I should say. Like, you don't know who it is, but you would know who it was. 
um, has referred me clients who are also elite CrossFitters and who are not elite CrossFitters because they come to me and they say, look, the reason I'm drawn to you is because person X said that if you can't help me, you'll tell me. And that was the truth. What other, so that's a, a, a really interesting tidbit. And I think something that's undervalued, not only in the, in the fitness industry in business in general, I think the fitness industry is oftentimes a weird accelerated microcosm of some things you see in business in general, because you have so many people starting their own businesses, building their own brands. Um, so those things I think get accelerated on a faster timeline, but what are some other things about working with influencers in the fitness space that surprised you for the good or the bad as you've built your own brand? I'll give you the bad first and then I'll give you the good so we can have people feeling on a high note. <laughs> uh, the, the bad is there, there's two sides of the bad. Well, there's multiple sides of the bad, but one of them is um, there's such a high level of pressure. And what I mean by that is when you're responsible to make sure that they feel good, it doesn't matter what else in their life is going on, what their training looks like, what kind of flight they took before they did the photo shoot where they were lifting the heavy weight that they didn't warm up to. None of that matters. If their hip hurts afterwards, it comes back to me. And I can't turn around and be like, well, you did hop on an airplane, fly across the country, sit for six hours, go straight from the airport to a photo shoot, clean and jerk 300 pounds. You shouldn't be surprised that your hip hurts. Now, of course, I say that in a tactful way, but then there's the, now here, let me tell you why this is not going to be a big deal. Here's the lesson you learned. Here's the way you're going to approach it in the future. Here's the conversation you're going to have with the sponsor next time you go about what needs to happen in order to have you come out and everyone's going to win. And that's valuable. Um, another downside to it is when you work with elite athletes, kind of like what you were saying in the beginning, especially when they're your marketing, everybody thinks you need to be one to work with us. We get people, not so much anymore, but we got people all the time who are like, I would love to work with you guys. I hope I can be competitive enough to do it one day. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Well, I know that like you guys work with Rich Froning. I know you work with Brooke Entz and Brooke Wells and Jared Stevens and James Newberry and Jay Jacob Hepner. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. But there's only a hundred of them in the world. We can't build a business on that. Like they, they are in our pictures because people don't stop and click on a photo that has my sister in it, who I love. They just don't know who she is. She's, she's not doing something insane. So they're like, yeah, okay, pedestrian, move on. We build our business off of people who are just like you and me. So that was another downside. And the third downside that I found was it's difficult not to take things personally. You can't take things personally. At the same time, it's difficult. So... I've made some mistakes in the way that I've communicated with clients, which is why I hired the coach where I knew, knew, I believed that the client was making a bad decision for their competitive career to work with a specific coach or to do a specific competition or whatever the case might be. And instead of allowing the client to learn this for themselves over time and find out if I was right or wrong or not really care if I was right or wrong to just support the client because they're the client. I would impress myself upon them. And it's because when I look back on it, I was taking personally that they weren't taking my advice. And I didn't end up in a better place because I pushed back. I, I did, but not because of those relationships. I learned how to not do things through those relationships and those communications. So those are the big things about working with elites. The positives are because there's so much pressure, I learned how to be great. I really did. You know, there, there was a level of um, care that I grew to be able to provide to a client just through the conversation of clarity, 
certainty and assurance that made me and our company more valuable than anything they had done before. Um, you know, Jared Stevens, I talk to him all the time. Like, dude, I don't pay you. I feel bad that you're constantly pushing us out. How can I pay you in some way? Like, let's create a way to pay. I can't just give you money, but let's create a way that I can pay you. You're constantly promoting. He's like, dude, you gave me my shoulders back. That's priceless. And, and, you know, I talked to him about interpersonal stuff. I talked to him about his life and we're, we're friends. So getting that skill set has been incredibly valuable. Um, the exposure that those people can provide, extremely valuable if you know how to leverage it after you have it. Um, the experiences. I mean, let's be real. It's you're, when you're at the CrossFit Games and there's 30,000, 40,000, whatever there are people there and they're all walking around and, and they see their favorite athlete and they go nuts and they wave and they scream and they take a selfie over the crowd because Rich Froning is 100 feet behind them. And then I walk back through the same gate over to the couch, high five, sit down. That was a good workout, man. It's cool. Like that, that is cool. So those are the really, um, the high points of working with elites. The interesting thing, which is not a high or a low, is finding out that those are people just like we are. They have stresses in their marriage. They have stresses in their training. They have stresses in their business. In their, you know, their pipes burst too. And it's just a, it's very cool and interesting to get to learn these things about people who you put on this pedestal because you only see them at their peak. Mm -hmm. In a controlled environment where they are elite. Just because you're an elite athlete doesn't mean you're better than the next person at managing family relationships, at no. keeping your life in order. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we see people in the context that where we want to make heroes, I think. And I think in the fitness industry, the longer I've been around it, you know, I, the more and more respect I do have for some of these superlative accomplishments, these world record holders, these multi-time event winners, I respect them more and more because I see that that is the product of just consistent effort over time, relentless effort over time. But you also see that, that relentless effort often comes at the sacrifice of other parts of their lives. Because you can't, you just can't be at that level for that long without giving something up. Mm -hmm. Everything has an opportunity cost. So um, I think it's a fantastic point. You mentioned earlier the impact and learnings from working with elites who have these huge social presences and the impact that had on your brand. At this point, your brand has a pretty big social presence. Um, mm -hmm. I follow you all on Instagram. I have for a while. You know, you've got over fifty thousand followers. You're posting a lot of content. I like how you get creative with the types of content. You're always willing to explore new things graphically, video, working with clients, bits of your personal life. What have you learned from your own presence online about building a personal brand and connecting with potential clients? I think the most important thing that I learned about that is that there's a faster way to grow and it's not worth it. Say more so, about that. So when I make posts on, on active life RX, for example, if I talk about like the strength ratio of left leg to right leg, squat to hinge, single leg to, to, you know, to bilateral, they always get a lot of buzz and they always get a lot of um, likes and comments. And I add a lot of followers after I do that. But, and it's but, I don't want us to be the company who gets known for having great programming. I want us to be known as the company who helps people solve people problems using programming. And that's a big difference. You know, when we work with clients, their expectation is always like, this is it. This is the magic bullet. You're going to give me exercises that are going to get me uh, where I need to go. And that's what I want. Well, one of the things that we ask all of our clients on Mondays is we give them what we call a lifestyle check-in. How was your eating this week? How was your sleeping this week? How were your relationships? How was your stress? How was your energy? And our staff is taught to answer those problems first. 
Because if those problems aren't taken care of, then it doesn't matter how much weight you can squat and deadlift. Like it, you're going to go back to having the stress. So I have a client, for example, who I just gave the book The Five Love Languages to because he was going through some stuff with his wife. And I go in and I amend his program every week because at the end of the day, people need their program. But if I'm attracting clients who are unwilling to have those difficult conversations with their coaches, then we're never going to be able to truly help our clients. So I want to grow the account in a way that the people who resonate with the message, the whole message are following and not only the people who are like, yo, can you give me like a cool set of single leg exercises so I can grow my glutes? No. That's a good point. Sean, um, we're kind of wrapping up and coming to the end of this episode. It's been fantastic learning about your growth, evolution, and continued development in the fitness industry. And I'm really excited to see where you personally and your brand go over the next few years. Where can people find out a little bit more about you, about active life, and uh, anything exciting coming up we should know about? There's definitely something exciting coming up that you guys should know about. Depending on when you decide to release this podcast. Do you have any idea when you, you said July, August? Yeah? I assume, assume this podcast goes live late July, late July 2019. If you're listening to the archives of the Bar Bend podcast right now, we're recording in June 2019. Yeah. So assuming it's not already full by then, um, what we've just released is called the Active Life Professional Path. And essentially what that is, is we've been very successful helping our clients. We've helped over 10,000 people across the world now. It's been awesome. A lot of coaches want to, coaches and gym owners are becoming inspired by the way that we view exercise and humanity, and they want to learn how to do what we do. So we started our immersion course. And, and the, the big thing about the immersion course is we guarantee money back before it's over. Meaning you'll make your money back from the course before the course is even over with clients in your own gym. And some people do really well on it. Some people do transcendently well on it. And some people do okay on it. We decided that we don't want that to be the case anymore. We want everyone to crush. So we came out with the Active Life Professional Program, which is everything. It's assessment, correction, marketing, sales, coaching in person, developing staff, business development. All of that rolled into one in a year-long program. And we're only taking 40 gyms on that ride with us the first time around. And I'm super stoked about it. Sounds like a, an interesting trip around the sun for a year-long program. So really excited, is, yeah. really excited to see how that pans out. Well, um, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. And just so folks know, where can they follow you? What's the best social media platform to reach you at or to at least follow what you're doing? Yeah, so if I can, I'll segment it. If you are somebody who is looking to get out of pain, or just wants a more thoughtful exercise program that relates to your life, follow us at Active Life Rx and ActiveLifeRx.com. If you're a coach, a gym owner, a fitness professional, ActiveLifeProfessional.com and Active Life Professional on Instagram. That's easy if enough. You just, yeah. And if you just want to, and if you just think I'm awesome, I appreciate that. <laughs> you can follow me at Dr. Sean Pesty on Instagram. My, my goal is that you see the biggest follower bump from that last one after this podcast. I hope so. <laughs> well, Sean, again, thanks so much for joining us. Um, really, really appreciate the conversation. And as always, I love that you're not afraid to talk about uh, the bad with the good because any professional evolution is going to include both. So really do appreciate that. Happy to do another full podcast on the bad with you anytime you want. <laughs>